Okay, so um, for people that don't know, Jamie Dimon is the CEO, and he has been since the early 2000s, of J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the biggest banks on Wall Street. And he's, he's considered one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, uh, Wall Street banker today. And he's currently in the news in relation to the Epstein case because there is a lawsuit uh, being brought from the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, which argues that uh, Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking activity was directly enabled by Jeffrey Epstein, particularly by two uh, J.P. Morgan executives. Uh, the main one, the main focus of the case being Jess St uh, Stolle, who left in, uh, the, the bank in around 2013. Uh, but they've alleged that uh, lawyers for the USBI have alleged that Jamie, J Jamie Dimon himself uh, was aware of the situation and directly enabled Epstein and the J.P. Morgan Chase has denied this and is trying to make uh, Staley, you know, essentially the scapegoat for the whole case and trying to keep Diamond away from it. But he's going to be for a uh, Diamond is going to going to be forced to uh, offer a statement or uh, potentially be interviewed under oath. So it remains to be seen uh, what's going on there and and how deep those questions will go. Uh, obviously, the U.S. Virgin Islands is making a, a, a you know very uh, praiseworthy effort to hold this particular bank to account and let's keep in mind that a few days after this uh, current this uh, this exact lawsuit was filed uh, the attorney general of the u.s virgin islands denise george was fired and so a lot of people see a connection between that firing um and her filing of this particular lawsuit uh which has been allowed to advance in u.s courts despite uh, jp morgan and chase trying to prevent that from happening so um but Can what I, hasn't been said right oh, well, mm -hmm. oh no i just want to ask you so what we'll get to the what hasn't been said part but just to be clear you say that jp morgan chase was enabling this sex trafficking by epstein that's what the, the lawsuit alleges can you can you be yes. specific what what how were they enabling that so, um, so someone that was actually at the hearing sent me a leaked recording of it, and there was a lot that happened there that did not make it into mainstream press reports. One of them being that it was very clear from J.P. Morgan internal reports that um, J uh, Jeffrey Epstein allegedly was having a financial advisory firm at the time, but his accounts at J.P. Morgan reflect no activity that would have potentially involved any sort of clients. Uh, it was very odd uh, financial activity and he was making uh, payments to uh, known victims of his sex trafficking scheme and he was uh, using JP Morgan to give significant loans uh, to John Luke Brunel's MC2 business and John Luke Brunel of course is a major um, part of the Epstein case particularly as it relates to the sex trafficking activities uh, and he of course was arrested in Paris and died under the same circumstances as Epstein did in a jail cell and what was ruled a suicide uh, but <laughs> is very unlikely to actually have been the case um, and JP Morgan is alleged to have directly facilitated that because given uh, their own internal admissions about the oddities of the report uh, uh, the oddities of Epstein's account, something should have been done long ago and nothing was done. And they allege, the USBI, uh, say that they'll be providing documents that show that this went far beyond just Stali and actually go straight to the executive suite, meaning Jamie Dimon. Wow. So what's not being said? I'm sorry to interrupt you earlier, but I just, I, you know, want to know how this, <laughs> this enabling process is unbelievable and much... Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Still gone. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, so basically what's not being said is that the reason Jamie Dimon is head of J.P. Morgan uh, Chase at all really has to do intimately with the circle around Leslie Wexner, particularly his right-hand man, uh, John W. Kessler. So, you know, Leslie Wexner has two hands, and as someone who's researched him a lot, you know, essentially you have on the one hand Kessler and you had on the other hand Epstein. That's how close uh, these particular associates of him were. And Kessler, um, in, in addition with uh, a particular family from Chicago that's part of the same uh, network I write about in the book that has a lot of connections uh, to Wexner, the Crown family of Chicago, uh, were essentially the people that orchestrated um, uh, Jamie Dimon's installment as CEO of Bank One uh, in the year 2000. When uh, So the Crown family essentially orchestrated the ouster of the previous CEO, and then Kessler and this sort of Wexner-centric team uh, on the uh, the board of Bank One, uh, along with the Crown family uh, and their associates, came together and chose Jamie Dimon to be the CEO of Bank One. And Bank One, a few years later, was acquired by J.P. Morgan Chase, and Jamie Dimon was put in charge of that. 
So essentially what my article shows is what Bank One was before that point and going way, 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 way back, very Wexner centric, allegedly involved in all sorts of criminal activity, including money laundering, uh, arms deals and very shady um, uh, financial connections with Leslie Wexner's The Limited, um, among other things. And on top of that, um, if you look at Diamond's history before he became CEO of Bank One, uh, he was building Citigroup with his mentor, Sandy uh, Weil, and that began with a company they acquired in 1985 called Commercial Credit Corporation. And as I note in the article, Commercial Credit Corporation and its parent company, Control Data Corp, are essentially um, espionage cutouts tied to these networks of intelligence um, and organized crime that were working together uh, to essentially... Um, well, make money, uh, but also uh, we're subverting U.S. Uh, national security by in engaging in illicit technology transfers. They were spying on the U.S. military, um, and they were, you know, essentially shipping off a bunch of sensitive uh, U.S. military and, and other types of technology to the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War uh, in the same networks that include people like Robert Maxwell uh, and his confidant and lawyer, uh, the father of current U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, Samuel P. Are. And a lot of these people um, are intimately connected, as I note in the article, um, a lot of it seemed to have been centered around this particular think tank called um, the American Committee for U.S.-Soviet Relations, uh, which had a lot of these organized crime figures, people close to the Crown family, like Paul Ziffrin, um, people close to Robert Maxwell, people like Armand Hammer, whose father was a Soviet spy and tried to buy a bank where a lot of U.S. congressmen had accounts for the purposes of financially blackmailing them. Uh, you know, these guys were uh, extremely uh, aggressive in promoting tech transfers uh, to the Soviet Union for the purpose of essentially uh, equalizing the playing field in a sense. But as Samuel Pisar told Congress, in the early 70s, it, it was to create a single unified world economy where you have private Western capitalist enterprises uh, merging their activities with communist state-run enterprises and ostensible adversary nations with the goal of, like, um, you know, creating a, a global, uh, a single, you know, economic uh, economy. Uh, it's very disturbing stuff. And this, this company that Beautiful. was at the center of that is now uh, Citigroup. <laughs> Wow. So a unipolar banking system, a unipolar order run by this, these unelected people running the world economy. That's basically yeah. they laid this out in the so, 1970s. So, yeah. So PSAR essentially said the nation state's becoming irrelevant because it's all about private enterprises in, in the West merging uh, and intermingling with communist state-run enterprises in, in Russia and China and elsewhere. And a lot of the major facilitators of this were, you know, people like, like Robert Maxwell, people like Samuel Pisar, and a lot of these other businessmen in this particular uh, nexus um, that involve a lot of organized crime and intelligence connections. Uh, because essentially, at the end of the day, they want to be, you know, whoever controls the money controls the world, right? So if you build a single unified world economy, which you uniquely control, then you control everything. And, and as you pointed out your piece and otherwise that this is they've been at the heart of each of these financial collapses right they've been there right in the middle of it. yeah a lot of them yeah so for example in the 1980s there was a major crisis with savings and loans and you had major an insane amount of collapses of, of savings and loans institutions throughout the united states you had the situation with michael milken and the the junk bonds drexel burnham lambert all of these are very much tied to intelligence organized crime connections i detail a lot of this in my book but there's you know the work of pete bruton formerly of the houston post and a lot of um, reporting over the decades on on that, and essentially what resulted, uh, um, what came out of that is that you know the the federal government and and the bodies responsible for handling these types of situations would take the collapsed institu institutions, bundle them together, and sell their assets off to stable and uh, financial institutions. And so you know an entity like Bank One, which is very close to you know Leslie Wexner. It was it was absorbing a lot of these and a lot of these banks today these mega banks these so-called too big to fail banks just consolidating 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 so you have over time you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of banks all over the country in the u.s and it's slowly becoming fewer and fewer as banks collapse and a lot of these banks collapse are engineered and so this particular article i have up right now about the rise of jamie diamond is really just part of a series um because i uh, also have evidence that in 2008 that was you know the collapse of bear stearns jeffrey epstein essentially was the 
you know, if you want to see Bear Stearns as a giant bubble, the pin that popped Bear Stearns was Jeffrey Epstein. And then he goes, and Bear Stearns gets folded into J.P. Morgan, uh, and then he starts banking with J.P. Morgan, and all the stuff at the center of the lawsuit that we talked about earlier, you know, are based in that in that period. But you know, uh, it's a it's a big benefit. Uh, the 2008, you know, economic crisis, uh, you know, was very beneficial to these big bankers because all the failed banks they just absorbed and you know became bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we're seeing now with the current banking crisis is much of the same. Uh, I would argue that you're going to see these uh, banks collapse. A lot of the, I'm sure as you've covered on your show, a lot of these banks didn't need to be shut down like Signature Bank. They were only shut down because they were viewed as pro-crypto. The U.S. is having a regulatory crackdown on the crypto industry, and now they're being folded into other mega banks. It's just consolidation, and it's leading us towards this exact plan that was mapped out in the 70s, uh, a one-world economy, essentially. Unbelievable. Uh, Not unbelievable when you see it all coming together like this in the web that you've uncovered here. One of the connections that you write about in this piece is where you point out that J.P. Morgan, their claims are that Jamie Dimon never really knew what Epstein was up to at all um, during his time. And as you very difficult to explain, given all of these connections. So yeah, their, their, their stance the same- is they, they didn't know he, he didn't know anything. He, uh, he's totally absolved of this. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard to believe because the same people that are responsible for Jeffrey Epstein are responsible for Jamie Dimon being the top Wall Street banker in the country. And that's very significant. And, you know, we'll see if this particular case uh, questions him about people like John W. Kessler, his, his time at Bank One. Um, and in the financial circles around uh, Leslie Wexner, because Leslie Wexner was on the board of that bank for a very long time and was actually at one point holding unclaimed funds for this bank uh, that allegedly the state of Ohio couldn't find Bank One, one of the biggest banks in the state, to return them their unclaimed funds. And Wexner's on the board of the bank, but also can't find Bank One to return their unclaimed funds. And, and the limited isn't a bank. It's supposed to be a, a retail uh, you know, company. So why are why is all why are they holding state unclaimed funds? I mean, there's totally a bunch of funny business going on here, and that was in the mid 1990s, not that long before uh, Jamie Dimon took the reins of that particular bank. And as uh, I note in my piece, and I, I, I referred to earlier, Bank One was money laundering for Middle East arms sales, including for Iran Contra. And as I've uh, noted before in my work on the the Wexner Epstein stuff, uh, they were intimately involved in that as well, particularly. Um, with their acquisition of the CIA's Air America, um, or renamed Southern Air Transport uh, in, in the mid-1990s, ostensibly to run cargo from the Limited uh, between uh, Columbus and Hong Kong. And, and this is at the time when Epstein is meeting at the White House uh, with people like Mark Middleton, who were central to this Chinagate scandal, which is uh, the same thing about this illicit tech transfers, but instead of the Soviet Union, it's to chi- it was to China. And you have uh, the CIA airline that was involved in all that stuff before at the center of it, but it's very involved, you know, with Wexner's business interests. And Wexner, of course, is very involved in China and has been for a long time. The bulk of his retail uh, industry is based there through his uh, longstanding affiliation since this from the 70s onward uh, with Mast Industries, which is based in Hong Kong. Uh, and he, you know, was lobbying uh, all, for all sorts of business deals all over the world for uh, to benefit China. For example, he was trying to create a joint venture uh, between the limited and uh, Chinese state-run companies to... Uh, in the Golan Heights, in um, in what is currently uh, held by Israel, but is actually Syrian territory, um, and he was meeting with the highest levels of Israeli intelligence and Israeli state officials to make that happen. Another example of private Western uh, inter- capitalist enterprises merging and creating joint ventures with communist state-run enterprises, and in this technology transfer stuff going on. Why did he need a CIA airline? Because before they teamed up with Southern Air Transport, they tried to get another CIA airline involved called Aero Air, and that didn't work out. And, and, you know, all these, there's hundreds of airlines in the country, but this is the one they wanted right after Iran-Contra. I mean, it, it's, it's very bizarre. And you have top Iran-Contra co-conspirators being involved in, in securing that deal uh, between Southern Air Transport and the Limited. Uh, you know, at, people like Alan Fears and Richard Secord intimately involved in that. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's totally crazy. 
but I think people really need to understand this history because it's having real effects right now because we're essentially at the end of the line of this uh, decades-long plan where a, a network of people tied to intelligence and organized crime have cr created a transnational web where they've essentially completely any sort of military advantage the United States has ever had in technology, so selling it off to our ostensible adversaries, and at the same time, uh, the politicians in power who themselves, like Joe Biden, uh, have economic ties to these same adversary countries are leading us on a march towards war that, thanks to these efforts over the decades, the U.S. is destined to lose. It's these are the functions of Lindsey Graham's uh, wizard communism. Uh, in his use of secrecy and the overthrow of the United States by these systematic surveillance contracts for terrorism, such as getting the FBI and CIA and military personnel, such as the Marines, to contract with Mafia and KKK as an extension of the Confederacy militia, the insurrectionists have actively engaged in these <coughs> pre-planned, central planned economies for the United States replacing the capitalist system targeting David Bowles under the specific understanding that the communists are fundamentally uh, incapable of performing next to a free market such as the projection for David's networks uh, under his legal contracts um, the contract schedule protected by law uh, and condemned by the Confederate insurrectionists who have infiltrated the government, um, have systematically sought to ignore their obligations to their American office in order to prevent the capitalist system from existing during these extended periods of time, generating the systematic injury to their total objectives, such as, but is not limited to, the reduction of the hydrogen vehicles uh, from the late 80s and 90s, uh, which would have existed under the promotion from the network, from their projections in the military intelligence, which would have reduced the CO2 emissions, which the false green parties have actively been condemning, but in realization have actively reinforced under the black market contracts of their terrorisms in the subversion of the larger market in order to create a less green economy on purpose so they have something to complain for fraudulently under their promotions uh, seeking power and not results such as but it's not limited to the function of the feminist incorporated promotion of lip service for women's issues while actively subverting every political currency that they have ever generated as they are systematically humiliated in the totality of the arrangements in their political accounts. Um, they, having acquired the position legitimately, are being subverted at which point you have a ladder up to a platform and they are removing the thing that holds the platform together. like. When you go to a circus and you throw a ball at a target um, connected to a person sitting on a chair above the water, you hit the target and the, per the chair falls down. And that's fundamentally what's happening with these structures. The target groups are actively being joined in in order to participate in the crimes, giving permission to the offenses to be conducted against them, specific ironic to themselves as they make themselves vulnerable to historic offenses and abuses against their political identity uh, as they are and have always been a suicide pact it's madness it's absolute madness and we're absolutely seeing it we're running out of ammunition you have Mark Milley admitting that if we go to war we, we have no we're sending all our money to Ukraine right or have uh, been and we, we don't have the production capacity, we don't have the recruitment capacity, and we're heading right into World War III with these countries, which is insanity. What do you hope that you, as a journalist, what are you hoping would come from this testimony from Jamie Dimon in this Epstein lawsuit? What, is there any specific nugget that if you could ask him a question, you would? 
Yeah, ask him about Leslie Wexner and John W. Kessler. Because as I noted in my piece, John W. Kessler uh, was intimately involved with all these shady businesses and organized crime connections that resulted uh, that, that came out of an investigation into the murder in broad daylight of the Limited's tax attorney in 1985. Uh, very involved in uh, very corrupt dealings. And there's a lot of very disturbing uh, financial activity that was taking place at Bank One throughout Kessler's uh, time and the people that are responsible for for Diamond being there is the organized crime connected Crown family, which among other things controls uh, U.S. weapons manufacturer uh, General Dynamics, um, and then and then Kessler and, and the Wexner orbit. Uh, you know he's essentially there. Uh, why are the same people that put him in, in charge of J.P. Morgan uh, the same people behind Jeffrey Epstein? And you know how would he not have known who Epstein was because of those connections? It seems very um, difficult to believe that there wouldn't be any sort of connection there, or that Jamie Dimon would have no idea who Epstein was and what was going on. It, it's just uh, doesn't really seem very credible, and I doubt he'll be asked about this deeper background to it. Um, you know, we'll see exactly how um, how far the U.S. Virgin Islands is willing to go. Yeah, to really push this question, um, I hope that they'll get deep on this and not, you know, give be given one or two word answers and then move on to the next question. Uh, Whitney Webb, uh, I encourage all of you to read her latest piece on her website, unlimitedhangout.com. It's called The Rise of Jamie Dimon. If you want a deeper understanding of all of this and these connections, start there. Read also her two great uh, books as well um, on Jeffrey Epstein and the Deep State Mafia, which is leading us into World War III right now and absolute destruction. Uh, Whitney, great to see you. Thank you. So here she's – listen to what she says about Jeffrey Epstein. It hides in plain sight. Epstein was hiding in plain sight. We all knew about him. We all knew what he was doing. What? What? You uh, all knew about him. You all knew what he was doing. You mean the President of the United States and Senator John McCain? The Senator knew what he was doing and the Senator did nothing? More importantly, you knew what he was doing and you didn't do anything about it with all your money. It hides in plain sight. Epstein was hiding in plain sight. We all knew about him. We all knew what he was doing. But we had no one that was, no um, uh, legal aspect that would go after him. They were afraid of him. For whatever reason, they were afraid of him. Uh... Sounds like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> hides in plain sight. Epstein was hiding in plain sight. We all knew about him. We all knew what he was doing. But we had no one that was, no, um, were there any follow-up questions to that? Like, what do you I mean, don't we, know. What like, do you mean, we? Yeah, who, who? She's, uh, she would say, everybody in Washington. Mm -hmm. That's what she would say. Everybody in the Republican Party, everybody in the Democratic Party, everybody knew. Who was the DA that or he said, I, you know, I was told he was intelligence, and then they were like, he had to take it back, he had to walk oh, that right, back. Oh, right, that's right. I can't remember what In the Florida. Was, yeah. I, and I, I just remember hearing that and nothing ever more <laughs> coming out about that. The system of targeting David on the basis of the projection of him becoming national security as the top ranked general of the intelligence oversight of a new branch of the military at the highest level of intelligence oversight capable of performing the act of arresting these insurrectionists in this aversion of the systems of crimes on their black market generating their dark money which actively promoting their ability to trade their crimes is actively paid for in the money laundering through their other schemes such as the insider trading to Congress which generates their ability to clean all of the money from the crime so they cooperate in a crime and they paid off with the laundered money or promoted contracts or contracts in the future once they retire from their particular position, at which point they're, they're engaged in an ironic self-destruction where they're destroying the currency that they are sacrificing the country for. So they're generating exponential amounts of money, which is completely destroyed by the clusterfuck of the inflation, which destroys the existence of the value for that money, at which point it is a Faustian deal with 
an expiration date in all cases and the irony that they aren't competent enough to do something about the things that they are clearly able to see and understand is proof that these confederate psychopaths are in fact suicide bombers. Other unlikely event would boost LA's economic growth even further. While Europe was in the midst of World War II shooting at each other and blowing each other up, the US was using LA as a major war machine and springboard into the Pacific Ocean. This allowed the US to fight Japan and restock at higher rates. This militarization of California didn't just disappear after the Allied victory in 1945. Today, California has the most military bases of any other state and receives $61 billion a year from the DoD. All this money pouring into California through all these different industries made California extremely rich. If it was independent, California would be the fourth largest economy in the world. And California was smart with this money, investing into education and business. Now it's home to companies like Google, Wells Fargo and Apple. And on top of that, it's literally the birthplace of the internet, which you couldn't be watching this video without. So now that we understand how LA was formed and how it became the third richest city in the world, we now have to ask the question of how the inequality in LA got so bad. During the first few waves of immigration post-World War II, land, housing and businesses were cheap to operate and run. The LA climate was nice and jobs were available. So obviously these factors made the city extremely attractive, which therefore encouraged more immigration. An example of this was large-scale immigration from Mexico and Central America in the 80s and 90s. LA basically operates as a society of haves and have-nots. However, such inequality is everywhere, no? LA had become so expensive, so only wealthy immigrants could afford to operate at high levels of society, and poorer immigrants were neglected and left to work menial jobs, while high-paying jobs required a good university education. Do you see where this is going? Poor remained poor, with few chances of escaping poverty, while the rich accumulated more and more income, and they invested it into businesses and housing. Which brings us to the main source of LA's inequality, the lack of affordable housing. So the answer is simple, right? Just build more homes? The California Housing Partnership recently estimated that LA County needs 500,000 more affordable homes just to meet the needs of very low-income households. But according to this graph, the situation is way worse. It's estimated that 2.7 million more homes are needed throughout Southern California, across all income levels, in order to fully eliminate household overcrowding and rent burden with LA alone needing about 1.7 million new homes to tackle homelessness. The second solution to reduce inequality in LA is public transport, something which LA and much of the US lacks. The lack of public transport in LA brings more than just simple inconvenience. It limits the mobility and access to opportunity for the city's low income population, leaving the city's poorer segregated perpetuating a cycle of poverty that has existed in the city for decades, mostly in areas with little access to jobs and schools. This causes many to turn to crime and other illegal forms of making money, creating a never-ending cycle that just never ends well. The generation of the wizard communism has actively reinforced the exchanges on the black market, such as the underlings who have to be maintained at the lower levels, including the engagement of harsher punishments and aggressions against them in order to increase the value of the products being sold on the black market for the higher elites who, being exceptions to the law under their mechanism, having actively blocked any remedy to the violation of their policies, um, exist at a higher Price, at which point the resources being more expensive generate the position of being a luxury good, at which point you have the accelerated value and promotion and permanence of the structure of the black market, which actively compounds on itself and intertwines itself with the various factions, which engage in the interest of generating the collapse of the federal government into the second confederate gov federal government which generates the systems um, through California against the rest of the United States engaging in the collapse of the United States into the various factions of these black market networks which generates hyper locality devoted to the corruption of their crime market which having been enticed by 
the rejection products of their luxury goods from their crime market being the primary attraction to the subject, at which point the superior powers not being able to be rebuffed like Jeffrey Epstein's actively uses the government mechanism against the office in order to abuse the various members of the public such as their uh, 1983 uh, policy to torture various members of the public arbitrarily without justification or cause or Lindsey Graham's version of it, which he has done the same for, which is the compounding exponential value of their crime market at the hyper-local level, making them basically kings of fiefdoms with only mild connections to the larger uh, loyalty to the society, at which point you have their loyalty in the creation of the Druid religion, the state established religion of the Druids, facilitating their loyalty uh, to the religion and their Druid priesthood uh, for the Confederacy, which is the white nationalist hate group, which would systematically betray all of their uh, former allies as they systematically betray them into the various abuses which they've given permission to participate in, at which point women's having historically received particular types of abuse would be sold to those particular types of abuse ironically. Uh, the black community would have the same thing, the um, brown community would have the same thing, the Irish community would have the same thing. Whatever their particular specific interest to compromise them would be sold to them, generating the position of the precedent of their validation of historic abuses against them, disqualifying any fraudulent notion of legality um, of recourse, at which point there is no recourse to a wizard spell from the Confederacy being the general construct, at which point you have your hyper-wizard nation uh, enforced by these fractioned uh, fiefdoms generating the systematic connection, at which point you have the historic norms of the United States, which have historically mildly restrained the interest of the Confederate war machine, which, once you break down the American structure, means the Confederates are exclusively naked in their engagement of their war machine, at which point uh, the historic promptings towards conflicts which had only been limited by the Americans will no longer have the veil of American excuse to not engage in the conflicts, at which point wars for the sake of wars will actively be invested into as the primary business model of the Confederate white nationalist hate group who like Lindsey Graham, prefer the specific interest of being able to simply point to something and say, I have the right to abuse it in any way that I see fit on the arbitrary interest for the sake of relieving their uh, addiction to abuse, at which point there is no reason, there is no justification this is the Soviet light blue helmets all over again. These are completely arbitrary functions, which is their core agreement under the crime market. Now, the irony is that they don't see what's plainly in front of them. And the observation that they're going to be betrayed is something that is keenly aware to everyone except for them in their non-thinking addiction. Uh, when you are trying to make someone um, do something stupid, you generally try and get them to become angry, and in their rage they stop thinking, and in the not thinking they bypass um, any insight from wisdom that they might have otherwise had in order to avoid the self-destructive behaviors normal to the society that they are entrenching themselves with. Lehman Brothers, a 
year-old firm filed for bankruptcy. The U.S. government said it won't bail out Lehman. Lehman Brothers staff arrived at work in London this morning to be told the bank had been put into administration. Filing for bankruptcy as the subsidiaries basically wind down or Lehman tries to... The 2008 housing crisis was kicked off by a huge event that saw one of the biggest banks in the world collapse and set off a massive chain of events that knocked the entire world into recession. The greed over the years of a few men built up a business that was too big to fail, but eventually failed anyway. And I'm of course talking about the Lehman Brothers. The 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers was the result of years and years of excess and bankers thinking they couldn't lose. The kind of excess that would cause a man to bring his own share to a full booked out cinema for a simple production of a terrible video. But to start this, we need to go back to the founding early days of the Lehman Brothers. Javier, roll the projector. Founded in 1850 by three German immigrants Henry Emanuel and Mayor Lehman. It began as a general store in Montgomery, Alabama, but eventually expanded into the cotton trading business. The firm moved to New York City in 1858 and transitioned into financial services, becoming a brokerage house trading in commodities, government bonds, and railway shares. Throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century, Lehman Brothers played a significant role in financing the development of America's infrastructure and industries, including railroads, retail, and communications. The firm was instrumental in helping the US government finance World War I and World War II, and was involved in the formation of major corporations such as American Airlines and Philip Morris. Lehman Brothers continued to expand and diversify its business throughout the 20th century, and over the years were involved in some of the most significant financial transactions in American history, from financing the construction of the Panama Canal to the merger of Time Inc. and Warner Communications. Over the years though, Lehman Brothers would take more and more risky bets and soon found themselves digging into the incredibly profitable subprime mortgage crisis. Just... Javier, roll the tape. And this is where it became a major player in the emerging market section of mortgage-backed securities. Its aggressive growth strategy culminated in the acquisition of Neuberger Berman, a prominent asset management firm in 2003. In the early 2000s, the Lehman Brothers began investing heavily in mortgage-backed securities even further, driven by the booming housing market. The problem was though, decades of deregulation meant that they could leverage themselves to the hilt on these incredibly profitable subprime mortgages that couldn't possibly go wrong until they did. But while this did lead to a crash, which we'll talk about in a moment, it did also lead us to something that we all enjoy, a Kevin Spacey film about banking, Margin Call. But John, if you do this, you will kill the market. In 2007, the housing bubble was beginning to burst. Delinquency and foreclosures surged, and the value of mortgage-backed securities plummeted. Despite the warning signs, Lehman Brothers continued to accumulate risky assets, and their exposure to the market became dangerously high. The firm had become heavily exposed to subprime mortgages and had faced mounting losses on its mortgage-backed securities. Lehman's efforts to raise capital and find a buyer for the firm were ultimately unsuccessful, and on 15th of September 2008, it filed for the largest bankruptcy in US history with over $600 billion worth of assets. And we all assumed that the global regulators would step in but they never did. The bank cleared out. Javier. The collapse of Lehman Brothers played a pivotal role in the global financial crisis, leading to widespread loss of confidence in financial institutions and tightening of credit markets. The failure of Lehman Brothers served as a stark reminder of the risks associated with excessive leverage and complex financial instruments and led to regulatory reforms aimed at strengthening the financial institutional systems and preventing future crises. The fall of Lehman Brothers provides a cautionary tale about the consequences of excessive risk-taking, lack of oversight, and the interconnectedness of global financial systems. A pivotal moment in the modern financial history, shaping the world's economy, the lives of millions. Nobody 
including me, anticipated how the problems that started in the mortgage markets would spread to our credit markets and our banking system and now threaten our entire financial system and our country. And thankfully since then, no bank has collapsed. And, uh-huh, Silicon Valley Bank, a few weeks ago. The necessary piece to understand is that they are systematically trying to ruin the United States, and they're going to try and say that the things that are necessary are too expensive. 